So good evening. So good evening and welcome to this evening's Slack public lecture. Today we're very glad to have uh, Dr. Siegfried Glenzer, who is one of the senior staff members of the laboratory. Um, he has an interesting career trajectory. He started out uh, doing his PhD at the University of the Ruhr in Bochum, Germany in plasma physics. From there, he came to Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, one of the other Bay Area National Laboratories across the Bay, to work in the uh, plasma physics program. Eventually, he became the leader of the first generation of the inertial confinement experiments at the National Ignition Facility there. So these are these, this huge array of lasers that crushes small pellets and tries to create a nuclear fusion in the laboratory. Of course, when you do that, you're kind of going blind. You don't really know what's going on in there, and you'd really like to find out in detail what happens when you subject matter to extremely high pressures. And to solve that problem, he came here two years ago in 2013 to initiate a program on high energy density matter uh, using our X-ray laser. And uh, that program's, frankly, been really interesting. Um, it uh, has produced some very amazing results, which you're going to hear about tonight. So uh, let me then present uh, Dr. Siegfried Glenzer to discuss hydrogen in a bottle. Thanks a lot. So today we're going to talk about Jupiter in a bottle. Or in other words, an investigation of extreme states of matter in the laboratory. So my personal story of Jupiter actually started with a Christmas present that I gave to my daughter. And now, of course, my son is playing with it, and dad plays with it as well. And what we're doing is we normally we point it towards the brightest object in the sky, and that happened to be Jupiter. And actually, we recognize it right away because Jupiter, Jupiter has the Galilean moons, which we can easily find. And of course, there are many interesting stories around this. Of course, it challenged the cosmology of Aristotle, and eventually, helped us creating modern science as we know it today. However, today we are not talking about the moons. Today we will talk about extreme states of matter, namely of the interior, or such as those found in the interior of Jupiter, where we have extreme temperatures and extreme pressures. And indeed, those states are now called warm dense matter. So let me give you first some definition of some strange units so the temperatures in the, that we are talking about are one to two electron volts. So one electron volt is roughly 20,000 degrees Fahrenheit, another strange unit, but some more familiar to you. The surface of the sun has 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, to put this in context, so we are hotter than the surface of the sun. Remember, iron melts at 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit, and it boils at 5,200 degrees Fahrenheit. So the reason why our matter is not falling apart is, of course, of the high pressures that exist, and Jupiter, we do it by gravitation, and you will see in our laboratory experiments, our matter will be, will be compressed, it will sit there by inertia for some time before it actually falls apart. So let's talk about high pressures. So we typically feel comfortable at one bar, or which is roughly one atmospheric pressure. However, most of us will not be so comfortable when la one large African elephant is on top of us, actually, we, this would be seven tons per square inch. So if we had five large African elephants pushing on one square inch, that's a big pressure. And indeed, that's what you found at the bottom of the ocean. And that's because it's one kilobar, so it's a one with three zeros. And you will hear more zeros to come. Namely, what is happening when we have 5,000 large African elephants, right? <laughs> Pushing on one, by, one inch by one inch, by one square inch. Now, you'll be talking about pressures such as those found in the interior of Jupiter. And now we're talking about uh, 5 million bars or 5 megabar. And indeed, those pressures are truly unearthly. The, the pressure in the center of the Earth is, is a, a, a factor of two smaller than that. So, why, are we, why do we care about conditions at such high pressure? The reason is 
If we understand and control these type of pressures, we believe we have the foundations for important applications. And I'll just name three of them. One of them of, uh, is creating intense proton beams, which are needed for widely, to develop widely available tumor therapy. Another one is nuclear fusion to meet the world's energy demand. And the third one is to provide some fundamental understanding of particle acceleration and actually to provide understanding of cosmic rays. So let's talk, talk first about nuclear fusion. What is happening here? So we have deuterium um, nuclei fusing with tritium nuclei in a so-called fusion process. And what happens when, when that occurs, um, some mass is being converted into energy. A helium particle comes out with an energy of 3.5 MeV. Oh, sorry. And a neutron carries the energy away at 14.1 MeV. And of course, these, these type of processes are powering our sun. And there is hope that eventually it can meet the world's energy demand. So why is that so appealing? One out of 6,500 atoms on Earth is deuterium. That means there's no shortage of fuel. So the, the ones demonstrated it would provide an unlimited source of energy. There's no carbon involved here, so it will combat global warming. It's inherently safe, and there's only a limited amount of waste. So, but in order to accomplish this, we will have to produce states of matter that are hotter and denser than the interior of the sun. Let's talk about proton beams. So this is a cartoon of an intense laser beam producing energetic protons. If we can control this, we have a chance to heal tumors inside the human body. We will directly destroy the tumors with the proton beam without a big effect on the surrounding healthy tissue. And of course, our goal is to reduce the cost of, of tumor therapy and make it widely available to humankind. And the third example, oh, let me just give you one, one more energy, sorry. The energy that we need to create in order to make that happen is proton, proton beams with 200 to 300 MeV. So the third example is particle acceleration. So what you see here is a supernova remnant 1006. So what, this is the leftover of a massive star explosion. It's called a supernova. And actually, supernova 1006 was widely observed across the globe, in China, Japan, Egypt, Europe, and there's even some indication that it might have been observed by the Native Americans as well. So it was one of the brightest objects, and indeed what you see, you see a remnant now, it means a, a gaseous cloud of 30 light years diameter. So now if you would think of a particle that, goes, that, that flies along, it would actually fly along the whole distance um, through the remnant without making any collisions. However, what we're observing on the edges of the remnant, we see intense shock waves. So those intense shock waves and their creation are at some level still a mystery. There are theories out there, there are simulations out there, but what we really want to do, we want to, we want to create or produce collisional shocks in the laboratory. We want to demonstrate the physics that goes along with it, and then of course want to use it to, to accelerate particles to very high energies. And of course, Cosmic rays exceed 10 to the 20 EV. It will be a while before we get there. So, but the bottom line is we, we want to understand the physics that lead to, to these intense shock waves and that lead to the, the production of cosmic rays. All right, so how do we do this? We use the linear coherent light source. So linear coherent light source takes advantage of existing facilities. So this is our three kilometer long LINAC. It was built in the 1950s for particle physics. It accelerated electrons to very high energies. And of course, some Nobel Prizes were won with, 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 with the work that happened here. And by now, it has been recommissioned to develop an, uh, the world's brightest light source. And what you see here is, is, a, is a video of how the linear coherent light source works. So we have an, a laser at the front end that creates electron bunches. And those electron bunches are being accelerated by radio frequencies along or, or LINAC. Those electrons are then being fed into, into an underlayer, which is a magnetic field, making those electrons bigger. So now every time the electrons turn, they emit radiation, they emit X-rays. And now 
So this emitted radiation is talking to the, to the bunch itself and is causing a micro-bunching. And is then forming an intense X-ray beam by self-amplified spontaneous emission of radiation. And indeed, actually LCLS, our intense X-ray source, is only using the last kilometer of our three kilometer long linear. And energies of the electrons are 14 GeV, and indeed, we accelerate them only about this one kilometer, put them in the endolator, and then transport the X-ray beam to the far experimental hall. And at the far experimental hall, we have the so-called matter in extreme conditions instrument. That's an instrument that's solely dedicated to do experiments in extreme conditions. And here you see our team of, of scientists and technicians and engineers preparing one of our experiments. And you can see these experiments have been done with large teams. We have to collaborate to make this a success. And of course, here you see two of my colleagues putting together the experiment at the target chamber center. And indeed, what you see, they're, they're aligning detectors, they're aligning the laser beams to make these experiments happen. So this is what you've just seen. You've seen the two colleagues working inside the target chamber here. And you have two, uh, two, two pipes going this way. One is actually our X-ray beam that has been focused into the center of the target chamber with beryllium lenses. And actually another pipe you see here, this is an optical laser. So what's truly unique here is that we meet or that, or that, we, that we provide a marriage of intense optical laser beams with intense or bright X-rays. And our optical lasers, they produce our bottle. That means they can produce extreme state of matter for a short period of time in a tiny volume, but we can do it. And now we have our X-ray beam to probe it, of course. So these optical lasers at MEC, um, we've used them in the first experiments on aluminum, and then later on, I'll show you our newest results that were actually performed on hydrogen. So what, one other point. So we have x-rays, we have an optical laser, we have diagnostics, we have a target where we shoot all our stuff on it, but we're not just doing this blind. We're using supercomputer simulations that tells us how do we have to configure our experiments, what can we actually observe the, the, um, the physics that we are after. And this is just an example that Federico Fuser gave me. This is a Sequoia computer at Lawrence Livermore Lab. It has 1.5 million cores. It's the number three in the world in power. And what we're actually doing, we're, we're, we're tracing particles in, in, um, with, with um, these simulations. And indeed, in this, this case, we have 140 billion particles and 8.6 billion cells. And those particles talk to each other through electromagnetic forces. And indeed, with Maxwell equation, or by so solving Maxwell equations, we can actually trace and um, figuring out what those particles are doing. So the next step then is to perform the measurements. So, and here I told you we have X-rays that provide powerful insights. And what you see here on the right-hand side is the hand of William Röntgen's wife, Anna. And you see that X-rays are penetrating. That means they go deep into, into materials and help us to measure the, the structure and the physical property of the material. And indeed, of course, we all know that Wim Röntgen won the first Nobel Prize in 1900 for that discovery. And indeed, the electron laser allows us to probe the bottle. So we have extreme state of matter that are short-lived. Actually, our states of matter that have, been, that have been produced by our optical laser only live for billions of a second. But LCLS provides pulses that are 50 femtoseconds in time. That means there are millions billions of a second. What that allows us to do is a snapshot of what's going on. And then as the matter is evolving, we can take another snapshot and we can actually understand um, how, how the material is either compressing or how the material is, is falling apart. So another advantage of LCLS is that we, the fact that we can focus it into tiny volumes. And what we, are hap what we are hoping to investigate uh, are volumes of submillimeter. So our SLS X-ray beam can be fo focused with beryllium lenses. And here you see an image where we focus the beam to 30 microns. 30 microns is a little less than the human hair. So, but we can actually focus it also down to 10 microns, or for that matter, down to one micron. That means we, go to, we, we can 
investigate very s tiny, small, minuscule um, states of matter that have been produced by our optical lasers. So there's one other feature here. What we are typically using in our experiments, we, we are doing scattering experiments. That means we take the x-rays, put it into our sample, and we observe the scattered light. So the cross-section for, for x-ray scattering or for optical scattering is very small. What that means is we have to have a very intense x-ray source, and that's exactly what SLS provides us with. It provides us with 10 to the 12 x-ray photons, and it has the highest brightness on planet Earth. So indeed, the work that I will talk to you about is an LCS called self-seeding work. That's a technical term. The bottom line is it's 10 times brighter than any previous experiment that was ever done. And indeed, it's about six or seven orders of magnitude brighter than conventional X-ray sources. So let me just tell you a little bit about how X-ray scattering works. So we scatter X-rays from matter to understand its nature. So we put an X-ray beam into our material, and our material, let's first assume fairly high temperatures, so we have, we have positive charged particles surrounded by, by negatively charged electrons, and now what happens is those electrons respond to the incident radiation. The incident radiation is an electric field that changes in time, like sinusoidal, and now those electrons sit there and they see the electric force and they start to wiggle up and down. Now you have electrons that wiggle up and down, so they become little antennas. So what happens is the radiation that comes in gets re-emitted, gets re-scattered. But those electrons are not sitting still. The electrons are moving. They can move towards the detector or away from the detector. <coughs> so now imagine you're on a, on a racetrack and a car comes towards you and then goes away from you. As it comes towards you, the frequency is shifted up, and as it goes away from you, the, 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 the frequency shifts down. That means we observe blue shifts and red shifts. And now we can take an ensemble average, and indeed we measure the whole distribution function of electrons in our system. So in case of a Boltzmann distribution, we can, we can just read off the temperature from the, from the full width of half maximum of our scattered signal. We can call this a speedometer. So now there's another process which happens when our system is cooled and has a regular lattice planes, and that process is called Bragg scattering. So now you have atoms arranged in, uh, on, on, in a lattice, and there's a lattice parameter d. And actually what you can calculate, you can calculate the, the path difference of two light rays that, that follow like that. And if you do some, some math, you find that the path difference is actually 2d sine theta. And if that happens to be an integer, integer times the wavelength, you actually have constructive interference. And that means you see a brighter spot at this particular angle. And that bright spot, if you now do this in three dimensions, turns out to be a ring. So you see bright spots like this, and they're called the Bayer rings, but indeed it is just Bragg reflection. And this happens when you have a regular lattice. When the lattice becomes distorted and stuff is moving around, becomes liquid, indeed what you find, you find instead of one narrow bright ring, you find a broad ring. Sometimes we call it a liquid peak, or we call it an ionine correlation peak, but that's indeed just an indication of disorder in your system that means the temperatures are high. So th here's the setup of our experiment. So we have our target sitting here, and indeed you have intense laser beams firing onto our target. I told you earlier we started off with aluminum, so assume aluminum sits here. And the laser beams that we are using are very powerful. We call this a gigawatt, or one billion watts. So now let's think of every human being on Earth holding a a laser pointer, and puts on the same spot. That's the same power that we put here on those targets. And here's what happens when, that, when you do this. Your, the laser beams are interacting with the outer surface. The outer surface ablates away, and the material is crushed or compressed. And you actually, what you saw in this movie, you actually saw Newton's third law in action, we call it actio equal reactio. What that means is mass flies to the outside. So that means the remaining mass must fly this way. Or in our case, we did it from both sides. The ablation goes this way, and the material is being crushed by powerful shock waves that move inward. So oh, let's see. Did I get this right? So now we have an, our LCS X-ray beam. 
And our SLS X-ray beam is then focused into the center of the target, and we do a scattering investigations. I mean, here you see intense device sharing. Here you see our speedometers measuring the temperature. And we can put this together. And indeed, what turns out to be without the optical laser, all we find is our regular lattice that we expect from a solid aluminum piece. So now we can do this by um, first firing the optical beams and then probe later in time and actually change the delay of our extra beams. That means we take snapshots during the evolution of our material. And then we see how our materials first become irregular. That means they become liquid. Then they're forming warm dense matter. And even in the highest temperature state, we would actually form a plasma. And these are the experimental data from the campaign. So this has a lot of information on this slide. I still want to show you this is how scientists normally show their data in publications. But we can actually just break this down. So why don't we do that? So let's first look at the first three low temperature, low pressure condition. Remember, pressure goes up this way, temperature goes up this way, and also density goes up way, this way. So we start off down here, where things are solid. And indeed, when things are solid, you just see the backscattering or the Dubai share rings. So now I told you the back equation determines where those rings or where those back peaks will be seated in, in uh, wave number space or, or in scattering angle. So now, and lambda equal 2D sine theta, right? 2D is a back concept. You're not, we're starting to compress the material. That means 2D goes down. The wavelength or the energy of our extra laser, however, is constant. So in order to meet this condition, the angle must go up. And that's why the peaks are shifting to the right. And now we can compress a little more, and now you see it shifts even further to the right. So all this makes sense, but in addition to that, you see a broad feature coming up. So now you see actually both. You see a narrow peak plus a broad peak. So we will get to that significance in a second. So for now, on the right-hand side is our aluminum lattice. And actually, what, what is shown here in blue is our, our, our cores, our nuclei, surrounded by our electron cloud that is tightly bound, that is close to the nuclei. And then you have three electrons per aluminum atom that are delocalized or quasi-free, and they form those conduction branches, which are shown in, in a golden or in orange. And you see this, everything is fairly regular. So now let's look at the, at, the, at the next three guys. So now this was the melting state. Now we push even harder. Temperature and density and pressure still go up. And now you see there's no more solid left. The back peak go, goes away, and now you just have a broad I9 collision peak. And I told you, you have shock waves going this way. This data were taken before the shock waves are meeting. And now here, the shock waves meet. And you see the density jump up again. And you see it goes further to the right. So this information directly tells us the structure and the properties of our warmness matter state. So however, when we compare this data with our theories, which are based on plasma theories, which are dashed, they don't agree. So I have not told you yet what a plasma is. So what is a plasma? Indeed, many people say it's a fourth state of matter, right? It's the first state of matter, solid, liquid, gas, and then plasma. So plasma, an example of the plasma is the sun. Another one are light sources or toys. Actually, we got one of those at home. And others are flames. So in principle, those are dis disordered systems of charged particles. So you have positive and negative charges again. And indeed, there's long-range um, um, correlations. That means there's screening that has to be included. But in the end, what you see, if you apply the theory, it didn't work. So in instead, what we found is that the state that we produced was a warm, dense matter state. And indeed, it has properties of all of the other um, conditions that I mentioned before. It has properties of a hot, dense gas or a plasma. And it also has properties of a solid. And you see that the system is disordered and distorted. And indeed, when we do DFT-MD simulations, those are quantum mechanical simulations, we find, we find a very good match of the experimental data with our theory. And indeed, the theory that produces this produces the, the colored curves that match our data. So now, I promise you we'll talk about this one a little more. Indeed, the, the simultaneous observation of a back peak and a broad fluid tells you that there's a coexistence. That means under these pressure and temperature conditions, 
you find that the solid exists at the same time as a liquid or dense plasma. So we had an initial state which was compressed, we had a melting state, and there's a plasma state, but what happened? We, just, we, we characterized another state in between, and we call it warm dense matter, which actually has properties of all three of these. So there was, a, there was this work on the compressed aluminum. And indeed, these conditions are what you find in the interior of Jupiter. But down the road, or eventually, we want to, we want to study conditions that are even hotter and even denser. That means what we want to get at is how can we actually produce conditions such as those that occur in the sun. And indeed, what we were after we needed to develop a new target or a new new experimental configuration that allows us to study hydrogen. And indeed, we succeeded with this just recently. This is just a couple of months old. What we, pro what we produce, we produce a supercooled hydrogen icicle. And what we find, indeed, is there's hydrogen coming out of a nozzle that sits here. So <coughs> you can still not see it, but here it is. And you see it's a hydrogen jet, which is, which is in initially liquid, then it comes out, and as it comes out, there's evaporative cooling, and actually ice crystals form, and it becomes an icicle. So it's very hard to see, right? But think about this. We could actually see it with our eyes, and you can see it with our eyes. With this. I think this photo was taken with an iPhone. So this is one-tenth of the diameter of a human hair. That's why it's so hard to see. The jet diameter is only five microns. So it's tiny, 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 but still not tiny enough. But it was a great start. So and I'll show you why it was a great start. So this is our, our hydrogen icicle. And indeed, you see in space, it just sits there, and it just wiggles around with an IMS amplitude of, of roughly one micron. So we feel, we feel like this is stable enough. We can actually do experiments with it. And this is indeed what you see right now. So you see the X-ray beam operating 120 hertz, hitting the ice. And indeed, you see those, 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 those data. Those are, those are individual scattering processes. And if you wait long enough, what you find, you see that there's a segment of a device share ring. So just what we observed earlier in aluminum, we see it now here again in, um, with our experiment on uh, cryogenic ice. So remember, the temperatures here are super cold. So those is very, it's very, it's um, very close to the to the absolute zero of the temperature scale. So in any case, we can now do the structural determination. We see the the Bashir rings, and indeed, we have now a target in place which is we can do interesting physics. We can actually study particle acceleration. We can study stopping power, and indeed, we can study fusion plasmas. And these are our initial conditions. These are now data after we subtracted the background. As you see, we can do the studies with hydrogen and deuterium. So these are our initial conditions. The next step is to put a short pulse laser onto our target. And what, you, what we use, we use the femtosecond short pulse laser. Indeed, the intensity was 5 times 10 to the 18 watts per square centimeter. That doesn't tell you much at this point in time, but it will become clear one or two slides down the road. But we can do this experiment at high rep rate. And indeed, here we hit, the, we, we hit it. So this is a 15 terawatt laser hitting our hydrogen icicle. Producing some radiation, maybe you're not too impressed, but our 15 terawatt laser is indeed as powerful or has it's the same power as the total energy consumption of planet Earth. So indeed, the electrical consumption of Earth is only 3 terawatts, but we have 15 terawatts because our, our, our plants are not very efficient. And also, of course, we have also other power sources besides electrical. So that laser can do the same as all of us. So of course, in order to make, for this to, to, to make sense, we can only do this for a very, very short period of time. Right? So we do it for millions or trillions of seconds. <laughs> but still. <laughs> so and you may have not been too impressed by the, by the radiation output. And indeed, you shouldn't be, because most of the energy that we put into our target doesn't go into radiation. It goes into energetic particles. And those are the particles that you see here. So this is a, this is a so-called Thomson parabola. It deflects our, our, our particles that come off the jet. And indeed, we can measure the energy of the particles. And that happens at 5 hertz. 
So we have now a very nice proton source, and indeed the, the energy of those protons is one, roughly one MeV, one million electron volts. And we can now use this, these protons to do radiography, that means to, to image things. We can, do, we can measure how they stop in material, and eventually we can develop them for tumor therapy. So now you have seen the X-ray beam hitting our, our hydrogen. You've seen the, the laser beam hitting our hydrogen, producing this type of data. And now we want to put it all together. And indeed, we do it like this. So this is our optical laser on silicon oxide, which is simply glass. So, and indeed, this is a laser beam on the glass. So it's see through glass. We see our laser beam. Nothing, nothing fancy happened here. But now we put also our X-ray beam onto the glass over here. And, and what it does, oops, sorry, it produces transient um, excited states for the electrons. And, what, and essentially what it does, it forks the glass. So when the two are overlapping, we can actually find this out right away by seeing a drop in transmission. And we can cross time the two to 50 femtoseconds. And now what we've just done, we now can put it together and we can measure how our warm dense matter, our warm dense hydrogen is responding or is developing as a function of time. So what you, what you see here is an experimental Bragg intensity plotted as a function of time. So what the drop in Bragg intensity tells you the system is melting and is producing a warm dense matter state. And it actually happens on a time scale of 25 to 50 picoseconds. However, our best simulations so far have predicted this drop to happen in 10 picoseconds. What that means is that our, our material is, produce, is going to a warm dense matter state much slower than calculations predict. And this is just the very first time that anybody has resolved the bulk heating of hydrogen and how it's been transforming into, the, into a warm dense matter state. So it's the first time, and we are very excited that we have demonstrated this capability. So we will now use this data to develop better theories to eventually, that eventually find agreement with the data that tell us that we can then um, use as a, as, a, as a theory input into our large computer modeling to further develop our scientific applications. And I told you in the beginning, here are our scientific applications. Right? We, want to we want to do laboratory fusion. We want to develop proton beams. We want to understand particle acceleration in the laboratory. So we have now the capability to, to develop computer models to make progress in all of these uh, areas. But let me tell you where this is going to lead. So let's first talk about proton beams. This is how, this is how it will look like. So we will have a, our hydrogen jet coming from left to right. And indeed, this hydrogen jet that we're probably going to use down the road will be even smaller than the, we've already demonstrated. Now we have a Intense laser coming from the left, interacting with the hydrogen. And indeed, this, those are particle and cell simulations predicting the generation of an energetic proton beam coming out of the jet. And indeed, you have seen experiments earlier. I showed you one MeV protons. I think we can do better, but now with, with these computer simulations as a guide. We will then use those proton beams, and we will tune their energy such that we can put them onto a tumor and heal cancer. So it means tuning proton beams means to vary their energy so that the, that, the, that the protons are stopping at exactly at the cancer cell. And why does it work? It works because protons happen to, to just go through material until they're becoming slower and slower and slower. And as they're becoming slower, they're rapidly stopping. And they're stopping in a so-called Bragg peak and if you change the energy correctly, they only stop where the tumor sits and just heals the tumor, or destroys the tumor and heals the, heals the body. So however, if you compare this with other machines or with other techniques that you know, such as X-ray um, or electron or, 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 radio or, or gamma ray um, therapies, what happens if you use these, this type of, of uh, radiation they actually attenuate on their way down all the way to the tumor. That means all the, all the tissue that sits before the tumor is also being affected and being irradiated, although, the although this tissue was healthy. So that's a great advantage of, of proton beams 
doing tumor therapy. And of course, we all know that uh, this tumor, um, proton beam tumor therapy does exist. The state of the art is shown here. It's 65 meter circular accelerator. And of course, the facility costs $150 million. And of course, there are only like 7,000 people that have access to it per year. So there's definitely a high need to develop these techniques further. So let's talk about laboratory fusion. So Michael introduced to you in the introduction the um, National Ignition Facility, the biggest laser in the world that sits across the bay at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. The National Ignition Facility has 192 laser beams that are shown here in red. And you see them here propagating towards a target chamber. This is a target chamber, just like the one that we used at MEC, or Metal Extreme Condition X instrument at LCLS, just the chamber is a little bigger. And now you see those red laser beams being converted to blue radiation. And that blue radiation is put onto a fusion target. The fusion target sits in the center of the target chamber. And in this case, it's a one centimeter long so-called whole realm, which is a cylindrical radiation cavity. And the laser beams enter the whole realm from either side. There's so-called laser entrance holes, which are just um, holes through which the laser beams can go into the whole realm. They then irradiate the inner part of the whole realm walls, creating intense X-rays or soft X-rays. And now you see the same process at work that you saw early on. You see that those X-rays are being absorbed by a fusion capsule that sits in the center. You see the outer part of the fusion capsule being heated up, blown away this way, and the fusion capsule is compressing with the goal to produce nuclear fusion in the laboratory. And then the, the, here's the first simulation, uh, here's the first uh, results that have shown very encouraging uh, data. What is shown here on, on the, the x-axis is the compression yield. So in, essentially, this is the nuclear yield that you would expect just if, you, if it takes the energy that you put into the fusion plasma. And here's then the, the t measure total yield. And you see, here they pretty much agree. But as the yields are going up, you see that the curve is, going, is, is turning and it, it goes steeper and steeper. And the reason for that is the actual, the actual yield goes up because there's additional alpha heating. So I told you earlier what is happening is when you fuse deuterium and tritium, you're producing helium with energy and you produce neutrons with energy. The neutrons just escape, they go out. But what the helium particles do, they stay in the plasma. And they, they actually are being stopped in the plasma. That means they deposit their energy in the plasma and they heat it up <coughs> further. And as they heat up the plasma further, they're, they're getting more and more fusion processes going. And as more and more fusion processes are happening, we call of the launch of a nuclear burn wave. And indeed, simulations suggest exactly that. Essentially, what you see here is as the density of the plasma is increasing, eventually alpha heating sets in. And as alpha heating sets in, the temperature is just exploding. It's just going up. And that's when nuclear burn happens. And that's when a lot of energy comes out of your experiments. Enough energy to make a fusion reactor a, a potential for future um, energy needs. So we do have these simulations that predict this. But of course, we are just at the curvature of the alpha heating curve. We, are, we have not succeeded yet going all the way. And one reason, or one potential reason, is that the physics models that go into these type of simulations are just not good enough yet. And that's where our experiments that we are doing right now at SLS can make a big difference and can help to, to better uh, design and, and field these experiments. So one final example. Let's go to particle acceleration. OK, one more. OK, so what we use, you take a laser target. So just targets like I told you before. Actually, we may as well use a hydrogen target that is, that is cryogenic and that is liquid. We now have simulations of a magnetic field on top and density on the side. We then fire an intense laser pulse onto our target. And we see how the magnetic field and the densities are developing. Indeed, what's happening is, as the laser is interacting with our target, it, it produces electrons, the electrons just move forward. They're like streamers going that direction. And as they're going that direction, you see around every electron you have magnetic fields. And this is what you see here in blue and in red. And these magnetic fields come back and they coalesce and they form a shock wave. And that shock wave is a collisional shock. So it's, it's, it's dominated 
by the electromagnetic forces, just as, tho as those that have been conjectured to occur in a supernova explosion and in the, uh, in the remnant of a supernova explosion. So here's how we want to study this type of, of phenomena. We will again produ we will produce this uh, a collision shock with a, a powerful laser. We will then take our LCS X-ray laser and radiograph our target. And our predictions are this phase contrast imaging that the density ripples that are occurring that are that are um, that are produced by the electron streamers lead to lead to uh, phase contrast images with with again with constructive and destructive interference. And indeed, if you if you post process this, we can actually get a density profile that will let us trace back how the electrons are being propagating through the target and how the nonlinear stage of a, of of this of a collisionless um, vibrant stability is formed, eventually going into a collisionless stop, shock. So you have now seen three examples in our work to get to this. And of course, this work could not be done without a lot of help from collaborators. Uh, shown all here, this is, those are, this is our high energy density science team here at Stanford and uh, the matter and extreme conditions um, team at, at SLS, of course. And, in order to put this um, presentation together, I had a lot of help from the Office of Communication team. I'd like to thank all of them. Of course, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'd like to take your questions. So, Siegfried, thank you very much. Um, we'll take questions now for a little while. Um, there are people on both sides, I hope, who have microphones. Um, this is being recorded, so please wait for the microphone before you ask your question. So, um, please, someone over here. I, I hope the people with the microphones can help me uh, identify who had their hands up. We'll come there. Please. So who's first? Please Down go here. ahead. Here, I'm sorry, did you give the microphone to someone there? Somebody in there. Front. Okay, well there's someone in front who has a question, if you have a microphone. In your last picture, you had these white filaments going on. Can you tell more about those? The next slide. Oops. Yeah, the one above. OK, so that, the one above was a reconstructed density profile. So what you see here, so those are density fluctuations, right? So our density perturbations. That means what you see here, this is a signature of a of a density variation in space. And that density variation in space is causing the X-rays to form this, this funny interference program, a uh, funny interference picture. And that's kind of interesting that I can't get this, get this back up. Here we go. So if we, we have to do it. <laughs> so it's elusive. You can see that. <laughs> so once we take those measurements, we will then be able to tell exactly the, not only the the density changes, but actually the exact densities that have been um, that have been created by the, the and by the energy of the laser that actually propagates in that direction. It's a, a fingering instability, right? You, it's like when yeah. you take a glass of water. It's like little tornadoes, or what? But they're driven by little by the electron streams yeah. streaming this way. So they're micros they're microscopic microscopic filaments. Yes. Okay. Um, those of you back there who have questions, raise your hands high, please. But please go ahead. So you uh, showed us research both with two different targets, uh, aluminum, I think, and the hydrogen icicle. What goes into selecting or choosing what target to, to bombard? And how, why do you choose some and dis disregard others? Mm -hmm. 
So we chose aluminum primarily because aluminum has been a standard in the community for many years. So people, the first thing when people do something new, they say, let's try it on aluminum because there's a big data set of aluminum already available, which, which one can make connections. Indeed, before we did our LCLS experiment, we did a few experiments at a smaller laser facility, a point by point test what a laser facility would give us before, or laser generated X-rays would give us before LCS X-rays would be, would be used. So in that sense, aluminum is our standard, or some people would say a gold standard, but I guess <laughs> scientists don't have enough money to use gold, so they use aluminum. <laughs> so once you know that your, that your techniques and your, your physics actually works out, then you typically go to the next step. And we, we believe we, we found evidence for, or let's, let me phrase it this way. We, we saw the warm dense matter states. We characterized the warm dense matter state. We, our data are clearly beyond anything that has ever been done, even on aluminum before. And we see evidence of this warm dense matter state, which in some sense could actually be characterized as a, as a fifth state of matter. So in that sense, our gold standard was very revealing. So now we wanted to go to hydrogen because hydrogen is just the element that you see when, when, when you look up in the sky during the night. I mean, Jupiter is mostly made of hydrogen. So it's the sun, of course. But there are many rocks that, that, that contain also the heavier elements. So there's, there's need for both. <laughs> well, what's my next element? <laughs> OK. <laughs> so my next target, OK, we give our secrets away. So we want to. One of our goals is to produce a helium jet. And a helium jet, of course, has the potential that we, we can produce energetic helium uh, particles. And I told you earlier, if I, if I go one more, yep, that one of the outcomes of a fusion reaction is indeed energetic helium. So we would have a way to mock up energetic helium particles without having to do nuclear fusion, but we can actually study the effects of an energetic helium um, with a laser experiment. Quick question. This, this is a non-technical Does anybody know what the status of the uh, National Ignition Facility is at this point in time? I had heard it was being closed down. <laughs> <laughs> so, I... <laughs> So by, by the don't way, take my, great don't tour. take my word for it, but I don't think it's being closed down. <laughs> so indeed, those data, are, this is actually data from, a, from actually a month ago. So this is actually the plot that is current. So I happened to ask the ICF program leader, Livermore, and he gave him those data. So what you see here is, is evolving as we speak. Yes. <laughs> All right, we will not comment. <laughs> okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, question on Bragg oh. diffraction. Uh, okay, who is? Sorry. Okay, why don't you go ahead and then yes. we have. Uh, on the Bragg diffraction, is it possible <coughs> to use uh, this technique to uh, observe? Um, aggregation of the molecules in water so when uh, these short-lived aggregations that happen uh, randomly. Is it so I'm not sure whether I understood the, the whole question here, but I, I think you're asking, can you, can you measure? Yeah, there are uh, local uh, fluctuations in water, typically that kind of freezing water momentarily, and then they dissipate very quickly. So I think the question is, can you, can you study the fluctuations in water? I think that's yes. And the answer is yes. That's the short answer. <laughs> the long answer, though, is that as the, as the X-ray beam, if it's very intense, it interacts with water, it will also ionize the water. Mm -hmm. And it will actually inter interfere with, with, with the water itself. So th that means you would have to probe before you affect the fluctuation condition itself. So in that sense, you would be challenged, and you would have to provide very short pulses to, to, to make a measurement so that your probe does not affect your result. So in, in other words, the, the answer is yes, it's, but putting it to work and making it happen is, is, going, is going to require some thought. But Actually, can, I'm happy to discuss it with you afterwards. Actually, water is one of those uh, compounds for which one doesn't have to go to megabar pressures to find very interesting phases 
different uh, orderings of the water molecules. And there's a previous public lecture on this topic, and if you go to our archives, you'll find it. Very good. Okay. A quick question. Um, when somebody suggested that you're using, of course, aluminum as a gold standard, what's your feeling if you go to higher elements, such as gold indeed, or platinum and any of those? Mm -hmm. The question if if it's much easier or much harder to excite those electrons? So the <laughs> very good question, of course. So the, the answer is it's both. It's easier and harder. So if, if, you, go, if you go to higher Z, you have more electrons around. The material is denser. Your signals are much, much stronger. However, that also requires a, a bigger driver laser to, in order to heat it up. So indeed, we have done the first experiments on gold. And what we did, we focused our SS expert beam to a tiny spot, to one micron, but put all the energy into that spot. And what we observed, we observed how, the, how, the, um, how electrons become free or delocalized. And, that, and we believe that those electrons coming from, from inner shells, and now those electrons cannot participate in X-ray absorption. And we see actually how the transmission goes up. That means we produce a transient um, bleaching wave in our gold. But those are just a very, this is just a start of the investigation. This was a very first preliminary experiment, but you're pointing in the right direction. There, we believe there's a lot of potential to do interesting um, science in the future. At the beginning, you stated that um, one EV was equivalent to 20,000 degrees Fahrenheit, I believe. Yes. How do you come up with that? The EV is energy and not temperature. So what are you, uh, how are you coming to, uh, to that conclusion? What's it based on? So that's a, that's a good question. It's, um, you would probably, you probably have to do some thermodynamic in order to, to solve that. But maybe I give you just a hint, okay, and then we, we can, we can go through some textbooks in a second. Actually, I have to go back a little bit. Oh, so, some more, sorry. <laughs> Here we go. So essentially, what, what, what I told you earlier, or what I told you here is that those electrons can move towards the detector or away from the detector. That means one electron here has an individual speed. But if you have many particles, then you can do an ensemble average. That means you can average over many particles. And what that gives you is gives you a distribution of speeds. And indeed, that's how a temperature is defined. A temperature is always many particles. A temperature is never de defined for an individual particle. And so an individual particle has energy. Many particles can have a distribution function, and the full width of half maximum is indeed the temperature. Okay. That's how it works. Yeah, OK. That's what you're saying, yeah. <laughs> okay. Hear me? Yeah. Uh, quick question on this topic and slightly off the topic. Um, I just read that Boeing Incorporation is going to use laser beam to uh, basically protect aircrafts or uh, vehicles in war zones by creating a plasma, basically lasering um, the air surrounding the vehicle. <laughs> and um, sending a shock, opposing shock wave uh, to the explosion, the incoming explosion, basically canceling the wave or potentially reducing it. My question, if you can give us a metaphor about that type of shock wave versus the shock wave energy that is generated in your experiments in a human kind of elephant example. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Anybody with a more challenging question? <laughs> All right. So uh, unfortunately, I'm not too familiar with with um, with that story on Boeing. So um, so shock waves typically travel with in, in terms of 10 kilometers per second. So they go very fast, as you know. And um, initially, what I thought of what you would say is that they're producing they're producing a plasma around around a device in order to protect them from being observed, observed by, for example, um, radar. And that's actually possible, because if you have a plasma around a, part, 
around like a vehicle, around an aircraft, the, the, the radar or the radiation from, from a radar would actually be deflected, deflected absorbed, and, or would, put, would be, would be um, yeah, redirected. However, even that doesn't hold that much water because just the creation of, of a plasma around somewhere in the atmosphere can be probably easily be detected. So that would only be wor working if you have plasmas all over. So creating a shock wave that is intense enough to protect an aircraft requires a bigger um, explosion, which, again, it's energetically, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. I see. Okay. <laughs> All right. I mean, that, that, that would require carrying a lot of explosions with you to protect you constantly. A laser does not have the. Uh, I don't think a laser has the energy to, to to protect you from a macroscopic uh, impact. Remember, we focus our lasers to the diameter of human hair, in order to launch a powerful shock wave, right? Okay. So, oh, I'm sorry. There's one more question. Does the container get destroyed when? The target gets hit by the laser. Does it contain? And the explosion happens. Yeah. What is it? Okay. Yes. What, what was In the fusion part. Yes. What is the question? So when the when the laser hits the container in the fusion part, does it destroy the container? Oh, very good question. Yes. So I've actually been saying that. Thank you for bringing this up. So in all of our t experiments. After the laser is done with the target, the target is not existing anymore. Right? It's, it's been blown to sliverings. So there's nothing. So we can compress our material. We can study it in a transient state with a snapshot. But as time passes, the whole material will fly into, into space and, and, and uh, nothing will remain. Thank you. Well, that seems like a very good note to end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.